loss. And today we have, um, the title was Auto in Hair Loss, but I see has now become Self-Inflicted Hair Loss. Uh, which is perfect. And um, we really look forward to hearing this ESPD expert lecture. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you very much, Veronica. It's my pleasure to be here, even if we are not uh, still friendly with this type of uh, style of talks. I would rather prefer to be with all of you and going afterwards to have a, a beer and talk and walk a little bit around the town. But it is like it is. So we are at home, just trying to keep in touch and trying that the science is still moving uh, around. I did change a little bit the title of my talk with the idea to be more precise on the aspects I'd like to touch. So this is uh, how it looks now, self-inflicted hair loss. Um, uh -huh. Okay. When we think of someone who has act on his own hair, you might think of something like that, or some of the patients I've seen, they look like that, or others can be a little bit more um, crazy, I would say, and try to show the difference between father and child with this type of a symmetric uh, haircut. Others will try to perform these uh, stylish, ways or even with a plane in the scalp or others with this strange way of mixing painture and haircut in order to achieve this fancy looking. Some of them might indeed try to be a 3D a style of haircut or how, how crazy they can look or even this literally 3D way of having a hair or a wizard on, on your skull. But that was not my point, so that will not be my talk. And I wanted just to make a little difference between what we call artificial hair loss or what we call the self-inflicted hair loss or the self-induced hair loss. During my talk, I'll try to cover the following points and we'll try to make a definition of what we are talking about. We'll have a look to some clinical findings. Of course, we'll have a look to some trichoscopical findings and we'll try to give a little bit of clues of uh, what are the options for treatment of this so difficult to manage uh, condition and all we deal with patients, all of us, we have some of, of this type of difficult uh, patients know how hard it can be sometimes to convince them to stop pulling or cutting or rubbing their own hair. Well, trichotillomania, which is the first um, entity that most of you will think when you hear about self-induced hair loss, is no longer considered an impulse disorder after this changing of the DSM-5. And now it has been reclassified as an obsessive, compulsive, and related disorder. In trichotillomania, the clinical findings are usually very easy. You are in front of, in most cases, of a female, and I don't know why this is the reason. Some would say that they tend to be more neurotic. Others would believe that is not politically correct. I don't know, but I have much more females performing trichotillomania than males. The most common ages are this you see in the screen from 4 to 12 years. And clinically, you see these artificially reduced hair density. And most of them, they come to you complaining of hair loss. So I'm losing my hair and you have a look to them and you see these artificially reduced density on some very specific spots. If you look carefully, you see these broken hairs. And here is one of my first points. The pull test, it's always negative. So there are no any telogen hair left. Most of the people pulling the hair, they first start with the telogen hair, which is the easiest to pull out. And then they have to keep on the anagen hair, which is more painful. So when you pull an anagen hair, 
it hurts you when you pull a telogen here, it does not hear. So the pull test is only for telogen here, and in this case, it's always negative. And in most cases, if you have time to discuss with the family or with themselves, you will be able to discover some psychological conflicts that you have. This is a clinical typical aspect of this type of patch. And this is also the most typical location. The posterior part of the ear is the, uh, usually the dominant hand. It's the one who prefers. So if you are left-handed, you will go for this side. If you are right-handed, you will go to this side. And this is easier because it's easier to pull your hair in here. It's not so easy to pull it from here. So most people will do it on this side. Another point I'd like to show you from this image is that when you think of alopecia areata and the most difficult differential diagnosis with trichotillomania is alopecia areata, in some cases it can be very hard to tell the difference. But I think the most important point is this dirty aspect of the patch. In alopecia areata you mostly have clean patches. In trichotillomania you mostly have dirty aspects of the patch. This is because there's some broken hair on the middle of it and sometimes you have some hemorrhages so the aspect is not so clean, it's not so white. This is a male case, it's not so common, the location is exactly the same and you can see that the patch is not as clean as the patches we see in alopecia areata. These are some cases from Ulrika Blume Italy. You can see different locations, also in boys. Some of them will pull their hair on these different aspects. And let me discuss with you some other trico diseases. We have seen trichotillomania. We know trichophagia with trichobezoa and the Rapunzel syndrome. We might know or remember trichotillomania or trichotillomania and trichorhizophagia and tricholeichomania by proxy and even trichodagonomania. And we'll try to discuss some of these entities or maybe all of them in the next minutes. In trichotemnomania, these are usually not so young uh, children, but mostly adolescents and from 13 to 18 years of age and they come to you complaining of hair loss, I'm losing my hair and you see these special patches of hair density that has decreased and you can see that these are artificially reduced and short hairs and they use scissors to cut their hair in order to try to provoke the family or the doctor if they are able to tell that they are not losing here, but they are cutting here. The trichogram is always normal and you have again these psychological conflicts you should be able to tell. Have a look to this um, adolescent who used to cut uh, the superior part of the scalp. Another case from Professor Ulrike Blume of Italy of the adolescent who was cutting in the same location. The, uh, the other type of uh, this um, type of uh, way of decreasing your hair density is the trichotillomania. And in this case, the patients do not, do not pull or they don't cut, but they rub. So if you rub your scalp for a long time, you might at the end broke your hair. And by rubbing your scalp, you provoke this not so well, not so well defined patches of alopecia. They are not so well limited at the difficult therapy it's common for all these three entities. Have a look to the patches, they are not so well precise, uh, the edges are not so clear and again when thinking of alopecia reata or thinking of trichotillo or trichotemnomania you have to think this dirty aspect on the scalp you see these broken hairs that are not usually present in alopecia areata. This is another case, it's not so well defined, the edges, the borders are not so well marked because by rubbing you cannot be so precise on deciding the place you rub 
have a look to this uh, funny looking case. Um, this was a very special case. I would say that the disease started with the central point, which was from my uh, the first diagnosis, an alopecia areata, and then he developed after having this alopecia areata in the center, this mania of rubbing the posterior or the around part of it, having this mixture of a psychotheromania and alopecia areata. So for uh, remembering the Greek way of telling things, trichotilo, here is plak, trichotemno, here is cut, trichotero, here is rub. They all provoke the same type of problem, and we will discuss the treatment of these entities at the end because they all have the same type of approach. Uh, the first publication of Trichotei Rumania was in the Journal of the German Society of Dermatology, with the group of uh, Ralf Treub uh, and Stephanie Reich at that moment, and they published the first case in 2003. We in 2004 had the chance to, to see this case of eyebrow trichotheromania, and in this case it was not a, a child, it was an adult, and uh, it was this frenetically rubbing on the eyebrows provoking the same type of a problem. This is a picture of the patient we saw when we published in 2004. We have perform on that case a scanning electron microscope to see if there were any specific changes on the hair shaft that could tell us uh, you are in front of a trichotheromania, uh, but not, it, it is not a very specific finding. So you see this just uh, open split here, this broken aspect of the end of the, the distal part of the, of the hair shaft. In trichotillomania, you have uh, tricks here, T-line to pull, and many excessive excitement. And I know that uh, Talia Kakuru, my friend, uh, will not um, be totally, um, will not agree totally with uh, my way of uh, translating this Greek. Uh, but um, this is as, as, fast, as, as far as I can, I can go. In trichophagia, you can have a fiber, trico, and vagin to it, so someone is eating his own hair, this is trichophagia. In trichorhizophagia, there's someone who is pulling the hair, and then it's eating solo exclusively the uh, inner part of the hair. So like the way of someone was eating seeds of the sunflower, they were eating exclusively the hair root. And we did publish together with Professor Rudy Happel in 2004, this trichorhizophagia patient that was eating the root of the hair. And I have to admit that the Professor Happel has a brother who is an expert on ancient languages and also ancient Greek. And he helped us on trying to make this uh, mixture of wordings in order to arrive to this funny looking diagnosis of trichorhizophagia. This was the patient we discussed and we published with Professor Hapler. It was also an adult case. I have seen no kids with this selective way of pulling and eating only the root of the hair. Trichobezoa has been reported with trichotillomania and some of them had been under surgical um, interventions in order to remove the bezoa, and the term Rapunzel syndrome was used to report this rare manifestation of the gastric trichobezoa that was extending from the stomach down to the thinner bowel uh, with this uh, very nice aspect of the princess Rapunzel that was having all the hair down from the window in order that his lover during the night could climb uh, using the hair as a rope in order to arrive to the chambers and spend the night with her. Um, if you have long hair like these uh, Indian ladies, I took this picture in the south of India in Mamalipuram, it might be quite common that if you eat them you have a big problem because have a look how long that hair is. 
these ladies in India, they have a very long anagen phase. And if you don't cut your hair, I mean, you, the dermatologist in Europe, if you don't cut your hair, it might grow approximately about a decent, not longer than that. But in some um, very lucky races and some very lucky people, if they don't cut their hair, they, it can grow down to their knees. And this is the case with this long anagen phase. Some young patients have also this quality. And this is a patient in, seen in, in my office some years ago. This was published in 2017 with this funny looking title, a fairy tale with a hairy tail. And it was a 21 year old pregnant female that had 33 weeks of gestation and he was suffering a bipolar disorder, was referred to the hospital for management of abdominal pain. She was pregnant and abdominal pain. So no one thought of something so dermatological and they had to open to see what was going on. And they found this enormous trichobezoa on the stomach. And the bezoa term is derived from the Arabic word batzer, which is translated as an antidote. So bezoa is originating in the digestive tracts of animals were used as antidotes against plaque, snake bites, leprosy, or even epilepsy. You can imagine they were not so useful when trying to use them for treating other type of, of conditions. Have a look to this other paper. In 2018, they had to remove this extremely big trichobezoa. This was published in the Journal of the College of Physicians in Pakistan a couple of years ago. A trichobezoa extending into the intestine is causing the Rasponzel syndrome. And you can see from this uh, article a very clear limit uh, of the ending of the stomach and the starting of the bowel with this extending tail. Maybe it is not as poetic as it should be if we think of Rapunzel and the lover, but it is like it was described so many years ago. What about Coca-Cola and trichobezoas? Well, you might not believe it, but some people perform a type of research that is not the one that we usually do. And someone thought, well, it seems that Coca-Cola can solve or dissolve so many products uh, so I can use it at home when I have uh, my tubes not working on the bathroom. So why not try to use it in order to see if we can solve a disorder? So they try to administer it by irrigation in order to see if it could be a way of fragmenting bezoa. So they use Coca-Cola via a nasogastric tube by direct injection and a spray through endoscopy in order to see that you can, you could try to avoid surgery by using this way of approach. They also tried to see in vitro if they could solve it. So they divided the bezoa in four different pieces and one was incubated in Coca-Cola the other one was with Sprite, the other one with soda water, and the other one with distilled water in order to see if there were any differences when you put uh, the bezoa uh, at um, incubation on these different uh, drinking uh, uh, options. They were changing the solution every 12 hours and they had to, this experiment for seven days. They were trying to measure changes in the weight, the density, and form of the bezoa. It's so sad to see that they had no results at all. They see no changes in any item after seven days. But I looked into the internet and I found even another more crazy article. In this um, article from these colleagues in 2013, they tried to, to see different type of cokes in order to see if they were more or less useful. 
can you believe it? But it, it's true, it was not an invention, it, it's not a, a joke. What is trichodagonomania? Trichodagonomania means that someone is biting his own hair. So you can usually not do it on your scalp because you cannot reach it, but you can do it in other parts of your body, like your arms or like animals do so commonly. Trichodagnomania by proxy is the compulsive habit of biting someone else here. So if you like in your um, fantasies of love or sex to bite someone, uh, you decide to bite or to bite hair instead of biting flesh, you might provoke this trichodacnomania by proxy. And this was a, a funny paper, in fact, it was a letter published in the Blue Journal in 2009 by Burgdorf. And they were also discussing with an ancient Greek expert about the correct wording, because Daganos in Old Greek, it means the same as Draknos in Modern Greek, so the wording can be a little bit confusing. I uh, have a home, a, a dog, a Fisla, a Hungarian, a Braco, and a cat. You can see the cat at the top right of the screen. And I did perform at home this type of experiment in order to see if I could reach the same idea. So I had my dog licking my left arm and my cat licking my right arm in order to see if there was a differences on the type of alopecia they would provoke to me. I had to buy first a very attractive smelling substances for them in order that they were attracted to lick my arms. And in fact, the results were clear. The cat tongue, it's much rougher than the dog tongue. So the cat provoked more partial transient alopecia than the dog. So that was the idea of this type of problem. This is the tricholeichomania by proxy. It, it would be the compulsive habit of licking someone else here. In this case, tricholeichomania instead of dacno. Many that would be biting, lecho would be licking. Let's move into some aspects of um, trichoscopy. Um, there are still some pediatricians that uh, have the doubt uh, if they should or not have a trichoscope or dermatoscope, I would say. Um, I don't know if some of the members here are still hesitate of uh, buying a uh, dermatoscope. You can have these very handy or cheap ones. These are extremely cheap USB. Dermatoscopes, they are extremely expensive, not USB dermatoscope. This one is maybe 20 euros, and this one it's approximately 6,000 or 7,000 euros. So there's a big differences between one and the other, but you can have a old type of different prices. So if you don't have one, just get one. Because with a dermatoscope, you can study nephus or melanoma. You can see angioma and vascular malformations. It's very good for differential diagnosis of pigmented and vascular lesions. You can make some diagnosis on tumors. You can see nails quite properly. You can study hair, so it's extremely useful for differentiating alopecia areata from trichotillomania. And if you are getting old, as we all do, you can correct your price biopia. And if you are not interested in all that, maybe you can brag in your private office because we like to have someone that is taking care of your skin by approaching so much. So they are happy to see that you do care about their problems. So should I buy a dermatoscope? Well, if you don't have one, you think about it. There are so many papers trying to show the science, dermatoscopic, trichoscopical science, that can help you on making your own diagnosis when trying to see if you're in front of trichotillomania or other type of problems. These are nice images from the group of uh, Lydia Rudnicka from Poland, 
Uh, you can see these broken hairs, the coiled hair, the flame hair, the V sign, the tulip hair, and the hair powder. This type of dirty aspect, the hair powder, from my view, is the most useful tip that can be seen microscopically or trichoscopically in most of the scalps and help you making the right diagnosis. We also publish in the World Journal of Dermatology together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Juan Antonio Moreno, these essentials for the dermatology. So you, if you are not very in this world of trichoscopy, and if you'd like to start, I'll be happy if you send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of this, of this paper. In the International Journal of Trichology in 2014, they published this specific paper on the trichoscopy on trichotillomania. Have a look to this dirty aspect once again, this powder, hair powder. Uh, present on the scalp. This is provoked once again by breaking hair and some small hemorrhages that can have this uh, very dirty looking aspect of the plaques. You can see on the uh, left up uh, corner these hemorrhages that can be very seen and this dirty aspect, very characteristic. In some cases as the center arrow down the bottom you can see this open end trichotillosis. This is the same image I showed you before on the scanning electron microscope on that the gentleman that was rubbing the eyebrows. These split ends, we call this trichotillosis clinically. Have a look, this flame here and the black dots. Black dots are not so specific. You can see black dots in many other diseases, but the flame hairs can help you and these dirty aspects also. Together with a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mario Cutrone from Venice, you all know Mario Cutrone, he's a, an excellent neonatologist and an excellent pediatric dermatologist. And he sees so many patients and he takes time to take pictures of all of them and classify them. So his talks are so nice and full of different maybe not thousands, but hundreds of our clinical images. And we have seen this, this very funny patient uh, and we described this dermatoscopical sign, the blackout sign. This was an adolescent that um, presented with this uh, a strange looking aspect on the beard and he had this red uh, rough at the touch aspect like a keratosis pilaris, that very thin keratosis pilaris and very irritated. And it was very difficult to understand what was going on with this adolescent. And we had a long talk with the mother and the mother recognized that he spent many hours inside of the bathroom. And at the end, he confessed to us that he was not happy to have a beard because he was the the most um, precocious beer man on the school. The other boys still were not growing beer, so he was a little bit ashamed of having beer, like uh, the, the ladies that grow their breasts too fast and they tend to walk like that. He tried to not show that he was getting gold. So he was using the, um, the pluckers from the mother that used for the eyebrows to pick up an uh, pull out all the hairs from his bird. So it was extremely painful and extremely slow, but he spent many hours. And you can see this aspect on the, on the trichoscope with these hemorrhages and the block out sign. Let's move into some differential diagnosis of the autoinduced hair loss. The most common one is an alopecia areata, obviously, on, in alopecia Areata, I have uh, made this chart for you. I would say that uh, the most important point, once again, it's in alopecia areata, we've got a clean plaque. In trichotillomania, it's dirty. In alopecia areata, it's well-defined. In trichotillomania, it's not so well-defined. Pull test in active alopecia areata, it's always positive in the borders of the plaque. In trichotillomania, the pull test is always negative, remember, Telogen hair, it's easy to remove, so the 
full test, it's only appliable to telogen here. So you never see telogens in trichotillomania. And in the trichogram of alopecia areata, you can see sometimes this trophic hair. In alopecia areata, the proportion of girls and boys are similar. In trichotillomania, mostly girls. All ages for alopecia areata, mostly young girls or adolescents in trichotillomania. The psychological alterations of alopecia areata could be discussed for months, but we most believe this is not the cause in most cases, and there's no special location for alopecia areata, and there's a special location for trichotillomania, and we have to say it again, this is the easiest part of our scalp to pull and to remove our hair from. Different problems of hair, different styles of barbers, so you can find these crazy looking people that spend hours in the barber shop but there's a special type of uh, alopecia caused by going too often to the barber shop. And this is the, called the physical or chemical injuries of the barber shop alopecia. And when you perform a type of uh, chemical action on your hair, you might be able to provoke damage. So that damage will be all at the same exact level that you never see this type of problem with other diseases. This is typical of curly hair, most typical of black population. And the most common idea is I have very curly black hair and I want to have it long, straight and yellow. So I have to remove the curl and decolorate. This is extremely harmful for your hair. So if you do it, too much or too often or too aggressively, then you get that problem. Have a look to this diagram in alopecia areata. You have uh, this aspect, this typical aspect of what we call the exclamation mark. In trichotillomania, you see these different lengths. So here it's broken in different um, uh, distances from the scalp. And in the barbershop alopecia, all the hair is exactly broken at the same moment. And if you calculate and you remember approximately, we have one centimeter of hair growth by month. So you can tell them you went to the barbershop on that day. And in most cases, it won't be so precise, but you can get to know what week was the one that they went to the, the barbershop. Ah, lopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp can be in some cases also in the differential diagnosis. In some cases, the clinical image is uh, it's easier. You can see that the patch it usually looks like an alopecia areata, but you can touch it. And usually when you touch alopecia areata, you feel nothing. And in this case, you see that there's something fluctuating. So it looks like an alopecia areata patch. It can be a little bit dirty, like the image you have on the, on the right, and it can be bumpy when you touch it. Alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp, it's also called pseudocyst of the scalp, and they studied in this paper 15 different cases. And in this case, they, they use the wording of pseudocyst of the scalp. And we published also in the Journal of Cosmetology and Trichology that we believe that alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp and pseudocyst of the scalp are in fact the same type of disease, so we don't need to, to differentiate. The last differential diagnosis I'd like to discuss with you before we move to treatment is bubble hair. Bubble hair is a, an acquired hair dysplasia that it presents with also localized isolated hypotrichosis. And usually we said that trichotillomania is here and bubble hair is mostly here. And this is because some people, after getting out from the shower, instead of using a towel, they go direct to the hair dryer. And because they want to have a very specific shape on their hair, they spend a lot of time with the hair dryer very close to the scalp when the hair is still damp of water, when it still is very wet because they haven't used the towel. So if you get too much temperature, close to the scalp when the hair is damp, you can have the water boiling on your hair. So you get these images of the hair. So you have this bowling 
aspect of the hair shaft with these bubbles inside. It's called bubble here on the scanning electron microscope. You see a swollen hair with this Gruyere cheese image with fissures and holes. Have a look to the scanning electron microscope aspect of the bubble here. So try never to get too close to the scalp with your hair dryer when the hair is still too wet or damp. So use the towel first. Let's move to the last part of my talk and I'll try to finish on time and we'll discuss about treatment for artificial hair loss. Some years ago, it appeared a very interesting paper on the N acetylcysteine properties for not treating lung diseases or coughing problems, but for treating uh, these compulsive alterations. And this was a 12-week double-blind placebo-controlled study that tested high doses of N-acetylcysteine versus placebo. They had 1,200 or 2,400 milligrams per day. And they had these two groups and the group treated with the drug showed significant improvement after nine weeks without any adverse effect. But then all the papers appeared on trying to see if this was well performed or not, if this was the case or not. And this paper in 2017, they reviewed 14 articles and they said there's only one double blind placebo controlled trial with, uh, with uh, 39 children and young adults, and they see no no significant differences in the reduction of the hair pulling between the N-acetylcysteine and the placebo group. So even if it was so clear at the beginning, and I have to admit that I have used that drug with good results. So sometimes our way of telling the parents that we believe that this will help them also helps them on being useful. So I, I don't know exactly how the mechanism of action or how the suggestion of the doctor when the doctor is very much involved on trying to help patients or parents can really induce this type of uh, nice uh, reactions or changing in the nature of a, of a drug that in fact, when you study it properly, is not working with the, for trichotillomania, but it can be useful if we use it in a very um, emotive, we can say, way. Together with our professor Arnold Oranje, that unfortunately uh, passed away already three years ago, uh, we also published this, this paper in the skin appendix disorder in 2015 and we tried to show in this paper what would be our approach for trichotillomania. And in, in this paper we discuss uh, what it's called the 5Ws and 1H method. It's also known as the Kipling method and it's a systematic problem solving procedure that tries to get a lot of questions and answers in a way of gathering information in order that you get the patient realize that we know what's going on. It's also used in sexual abuse and it can be used for trying to discover things that a patient is not so easy to talk with the doctor. And this was my first, uh, my last uh, slide on, on my talk and together with all my friends from the ESPD that it's been already many years that we've been all around and I miss you all that we cannot see each other now and we have to do this type of uh, meetings and after the meeting sometimes we take these uh, funny pictures you can recognize here Dirk van Geisel uh, also Mario Cutrone and Talia is over there. I think Barbara Kunz is also there. And Carlo Gilmetti at the end of the image. I know it's a little bit uh, moved, to her, but uh, they are all there. And I will end with this uh, type of a proposal that I'm not sure if it will be really arriving to the date we want it. So we are organizing a hair meeting in Barcelona. Might be in June or we'll have to move it a little bit farther because of the coronavirus and not being solved by June. But if you want to be updated, just 
get on the website barcelonahair.org and you'll keep receiving all the updates about the new date or changing of the ship. Well, thank you very much all for your attention. I'm here happy to discuss any question that might arise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramon. That was absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I particularly like the lizard haircut. I think we, we could go for that. <laughs> I'm not so sure about your tricobiz bars, which really are <laughs> really terrible. But um, the Coca-Cola study was really fascinating. Um, <laughs> I also really liked your explanation of the placebo effect, actually. We must not forget this, and particularly maybe with conditions which are have a psychological aspect, maybe it is even more powerful. Indeed. Um, I do just, uh, just while everyone's thinking of questions, I have one to start us off. So, sure. um, as trichotillomaneous are classified as an OCD, have you ever seen other characteristics of OCD in your patients who have it? Mm -hmm. um, what type of um, signs are you thinking of? Well, the other things that they're classically supposed to have, so being very obsessive about, for example, hand washing or tidiness or uh, routines or... I, I think, um, at least in my experience, uh, I, I wouldn't say that the children are so much affected for, by this type of problems that mostly would affect uh, post adolescents or adults. So at least in my experience, and I'm very fancy of uh, psychological problems in, in adults, but uh, I, I have to admit I have not seen children affected by the classical the compulsive disorders that we see in, in adults and mostly dermatologists would not see them and now we have all seen patients with this uh, irritant contact dermatitis by this um, hand washing because of the virus and these hydro gels that we use too much and I've seen this in adults uh, complaining with this compulsive way of washing hands but I have never seen this in, in children. Have any one of you experienced on that? I was just wondering if you thought it was an appropriate classification then. Do, do we really think it's going to be? <laughs> it's a good point, yeah. It's a good point. It might be probably, again, need to be discussed. Yeah, has anyone else seen? Or, and has, has anyone else more questions? Do please um, unmute yourself and ask, or if you prefer to send it on a chat, that's okay as well. Oh, we do have a question from Lucretia, who yeah. said, very nice and interesting talk. Do you have a trick to explain to the parents of the affected patients? I think she might mean trichotillomania or maybe in general for people with auto-induced hair disorders. Uh -huh. I think there's no a specific trick, um, but uh, I think the, the best uh, approach if you are able to have the patient in front of you and the parents arrive to recognize the situation. It's not easy and sometimes you need some time and sometimes it cannot be done on the first day, but when you get in confidence with them and you try to tell them, have you seen if uh, she's touching the hair or have you seen that she spent some time on the, on the bathroom, uh, so on, this might help you a little bit on, on the approach. But I, I have to admit, I don't have a specific wording or specific system for approaching it. And this, uh, if you'd like to read this paper of the Kipling method, this gives you a very systematic way of doing this type of, uh, it's not a psychiatric interrogative, but it's a way of approaching people when they don't want to tell you something and you have to pick it from the questions you ask. Fantastic. Flora says, dear Ramon, thank you very much for your interesting lecture. But she thank doesn't you, have a question. So you're <laughs> thank, good. thank you, Flora. Any questions from anyone else? No, I think you might be okay. And really, really good that you're doing your hair meeting. That's it's the first one. That sounds good. That sounds like it will be a series of hair. We, we had the, the world meeting of hair research just before the pandemic and mm -hmm. it was very successful so we decided that after the world hair meeting 
we'll try to do an every year meeting on hair, but it was impossible because all started on that moment. So we'll see if we'll have to move again. This date has been moved three times, so I'm not sure if in June everything will be all right. They say it will be nice to move in June, but I think we are most, uh, we will be most at least a little bit scared about moving ourselves around, I'm not sure. Yeah, we know the problem. Yeah. Um, there's a comment from Anka who says, thank you very much. Do you consider psychiatric consultation? Hmm. It's a very nice point. And we were discussing this last week. We had a meeting with a psychiatrist in our institution. I, uh, I, it might be different in, in different countries, but um, I would say here, there's a kind of a stigma for this word. So if I have um, a hair problem, I don't want to be sent to the mat doctor. So I would say that most people will not attend if you suggest to be sent to them. But uh, th this might differ in different countries. I remember in the uh, SDAP meeting, the European Society for Dermatology and Psychiatry meeting some years ago, the group uh, uh, in Paris, they created what they call the liaison clinic. This was a very nice idea. You see the patient in the dermatological clinic and you ask the patient to come back next week at the dermatological clinic, that uh, she will have this, the, the chance to be visited by a specialist doctor on his, her problem. And you don't tell what, what is the specialist on. So someone who is very um, uh, practical on your type of problem will be attending you. And you have a psychiatrist or a psychologist coming to the dermatological clinic on that day. And this is called the liaison clinic. So the patient, if he's a little bit intelligent, after a couple of minutes, they will realize the questions are not dermatological, but a psycho psychological approach or psychiatric. And this is also very useful for adult problems like sore mouth or even uh, the Lucio Parasitorum, which is very difficult. So I think it's a, a very good approach. If you have a, a rich department that can afford this <laughs> mixture of having uh, uh, colleagues coming to you, it's like um, with this um, other type of problems like the uh, breast cancer, the, you can have oncologists or gynecologists or plastic surgeons all working on the same department. And this is very helpful for the patients, I believe. Fantastic answer. Yeah, we have a comment from a Christina Bedinario who says, great talk, thank you. Thank you. They, they run psychodermatology clinics. Uh -huh. It's true, but I think sometimes it suffers from the same problem that you're labeling it before they go. So yeah. it can be difficult to get them to go. Um, Shula says, thank you for your talk. It could be so hard to speak without reactions. <laughs> Yeah, difficult. <laughs> I was standing to try to motivate a little bit me, but it's hard to be, to be motivated in front of your computer at home. I think standing helps out. I think you're right. Actually. Yeah, a little bit. It helps a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Well, I think you did manage. It was, it was very nice hearing you and seeing you and being with you a little bit. Okay, you are all far apart. You are also kind. You are all friends. I know you are all friends. <laughs> It is very nice to see each other. I think this is really good, good new forum for this. Yeah. Okay, okay. I think we have all the questions that we, we have. And Ramon, thank you very, very much. Um, if, if people want to unmute to clap, please do. Because I will clap for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That helps. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> But don't forget to register for next month's lecture. Um, Susanna is fantastic. She will be sending out the, the uh, email to everyone just to remind you. There's always one, I think, the day before as well. Um, yes. It's always the first Wednesday of the month at this time. Um, so uh, hope to see you all in January. Have a good Christmas. Same Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.